Hey, greetings. Uh, my name is Shane Mater, and I am making this video to try and help out other people who uh, might um, be still looking for information on how to breed Gila monsters. I know that uh, some of the information that's out there is a little bit older, and uh, it's stuff that I was reading when uh, when I was trying to breed them, and it doesn't seem like there's much updated uh, newer information. So uh, I'm going to add uh, my take on, on how to breed Gila monsters. Uh, I haven't been like the most successful person at it, but I have been able to consistently breed them. Uh, you know, it seems like year after year. So um, uh, I'll, I'll take you through what I do. It, it, it's not rocket science. It, it's not um, it's not as easy as breeding corn snakes, but at the same time, um, it, it's not impossible. There's just a few things that uh, I feel that are important to stay consistent, and and, and I think that that. It's more or less what leads to successful breeding of the Gila monsters is, is consistency in uh, their their environment and their hi hibernating uh, techniques, and also uh, obviously incubation of the eggs is, is a whole different story. Um, I can make another video on that sometime. Um, I I accidentally discovered a, a great way to to incubate my Gila monster eggs, and it took a, a couple years of trial and error, and then uh, lo and behold. Um, it, Almost every one of my Gila monster eggs hatched after I accidentally discovered, um, you know, my technique, which other people might not agree with. Um, I also swear by the fact that I can sex these things because for the last six years, I've never been wrong. So other people might not agree that that I can do it or that it's that easy, but it really is. And I, I think, I think the people that were originally breeding them, like, uh, and and I'm not being negative. Uh, like Dr. Seward and Steve Osborne, um, I think they've known all along that uh, that they they can sex them. Uh, they just didn't want to want to give out the uh, you know the secret to it. So um, I'll, I'll make another video on that because it's it, it's so unbelievably easy that it, you'll be shocked. So um, anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, check my list here. Uh, so. The, uh, uh, the history on my Gila Monster collection is I, I got my first Gila Monster in 2020 and it's currently 2022 now. So it's been 22 years ago when I got my first one. And I bought uh, two from uh, Steve Osborne at the Daytona show. I ran right over and gave him a deposit and uh, I bought two more from Don Hamper. So I had four to start out with that first year. They were babies. And uh, I was on a waiting list, so anyway, I finally got them, and I, I did get them in uh, in the year 2000. Um, raised them up, and so uh, you know, I, at year number three, I was trying to breed them, and that's typically what most people do. I was feeding them every three days, and they were growing rapidly, uh, more rapidly than I would I would grow them up now. Um, but at the time, uh, that's what the thing was to do. So. By, uh, by 2006, I'd acquired a few more. I think I had 10 altogether, and most of mine, I, I mean, I, I bought the, the first ones outright, and, and there are some that I've just, you know, purchased, um, but the, uh, the majority of them, I, uh, I got through trades. Um, I was breeding a lot of rattlesnakes, so, um, the, the, and, and kind of rare rattlesnakes, so um, I was able to trade people uh, my rattlesnakes for Gila Monster, so it, it didn't end up costing me as much money as it normally would. So by 2012, I had uh, 55, 55 Gila monsters and 17 beaded lizards. So I had a pr pretty good collection going. Um, but anyway, to, to, to get back to the breeding part of it, um, what I did in the early days was, um, and, and this is, uh, you know, I did a bunch of different things. I'm going to tell you what worked. Um, so I'm in Florida. I'm in Florida now. I've moved to Arizona, which I've, I've had to. Uh, I sold off my entire collection, except I kept 20 uh, Gila monsters back, and they're on loan to the person that I'm visiting here in Florida, so I'm here to, to kind of get them ready for, for breeding right now, um, because I wanted to stay the same as I, as I always have. Uh, so um, <clears throat> here's what I do. Every year, um, uh, at, on October 1st, I stop feeding them. Um, and this is a, the the uh, the animals tradition. We're all in one big room. I had a separate snake building, and it was 24 by 24. It was a nice room, and all the Gila monsters were kept in vision cages, not in tubs. They were kept in vision cages. So I like to be able to see them. I think it's important that they feel, you know, they can see out, and, and I, I just think aesthetically to me it was a lot better. Also, 
So, um, on October 1st, I stopped feeding everything. Gila monsters, beaded lizards, rattlesnakes, everything. Um, at that point, you know, I let them clean out their systems. I had the, the air uh, set to the normal ambient temperature about 78 to 82, which is what I feel comfortable with in the snake room. And um, <clears throat> on October 31st, which is Halloween, then the next morning, that's when I turn the, uh, the air on, all the heat tape goes off because uh, I normally have heat tape underneath the, uh, the vision cages and a, and a section of it. Um, everything gets turned off and I just crank the air conditioner to full blast. Um, I don't gradually try and let, uh, you know, lower anything down because in Florida I, I'm really not going to be able to get that cold anyway. So um, I just crank the AC as much as it can, uh, much as it can go. And with an air conditioner, the most I'm able to get it down to in that room is generally about 60. Um, if we have a cold night or something, you know, it's going to get maybe to 55, uh, but it's not going to stay there for very long. And, and, and honestly, my, my temperature goes between like 62 and 65, and, and I would say 63 is pretty much about the average that they're going to stay at for the next two and a half months. Um, so I just crank the AC down, I turn the lights out on the cages, and uh, if I'm in there working, then I have the, you know, the regular lights on. Uh, but they all have hide boxes in there. They all have water. I don't put them in any different cages or anything. I leave them in the exact same cages they, they are normally in, uh, which I think also is important because the years when I tried to put them in smaller containers and then put them like in my garage or someplace that, you know, maybe got a little cooler, um, just moving them around and putting them in a different environment I think throws them off. Um, years ago, Bob Applegate told me that uh, once he moved his collection to a new house, it took three years before they started breeding again, and I'd heard that from other people. So I, I don't know how true it is, but I just I didn't want to uh, you know to move them um, if I didn't have to because that just adds another layer of stress on the animal. So everything's in its, in its uh, same cage. The air conditioner's cranked down. Um, like I said, it's going to be two and a half months. I make sure they have water. Make sure the humidity stays around 50 or so because uh, you don't want them to get too dry. And uh, on uh, the week before Valentine's Day is when I go ahead and turn the air conditioner off. And uh, <clears throat> I don't turn the heat tape on yet. I just turn the air conditioner off. So that week before Valentine's Day, they're kind of starting to come back up to room temperature, uh, the normal room temperature of 78 to 82. On Valentine's Day, that's my like trigger date when I go ahead and turn the heat tape back on, and I'll turn the heat tape back on to about 90. I don't have it up real high, I just turn it to about 90. Um, then on uh, three days after Valentine's Day is when I'm gonna feed them for the first time. And I don't power feed them. Remember, they haven't eaten for two and a half months. So you don't wanna shock their system by you know giving them a huge meal or anything. Give them something small. You know, I'm gonna give them you know, like one mouse a piece, male, female, and even the big beaded lizards. I'm going to give them, you know, maybe a big mouse, um, but I'm only going to give them one and let their digestive system kind of warm back up and, and get used to it. Obviously, I make sure that they have water and everything, um, and then the uh, also the uh, the lights on timers come back on. So I'm going to have 12 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness, and then I might extend that light cycle a little bit more as we get into the summertime. But at that point, it really doesn't make any difference. Um, so uh, on the third day after uh, Valentine's Day, that's when they eat, and then on day number six or seven, after they've had a little time to digest that food, that's when I go ahead and put the males in with the females, or the females in with the males. It, it, to me, it doesn't make any difference. One thing I'll add is that I tried doing the male combating uh, early in my, in my Gila breeding attempts, and it just caused me way too much stress. I mean, the animals are in there fighting, you know, I've had them grab a leg and start doing the alligator roll, and there's blood all over. I had one of them uh, get bitten an artery underneath the leg, and I had to use a, uh, which I, I highly recommend this, um, you can get a stop stick, which it looks like a piece of chalk. It's, it's to help uh, uh, stop cuts when you're shaving, so you can buy it in the pharmacy section. Um, but you put that stop stick on there, I don't know exactly what's in there, but it makes the blood coagulate and stops the bleeding. So I had to use that on one of the Gila monsters where they had an arterial tear, you know, from fighting, and, um, and it worked. So I, you know, thank God it worked. But um, anyway, after that, I just, I didn't do the male combat anymore because it was just too much stress for me and I didn't want to injure any of the animals. So 
um, what I do is I, I keep good notes on, on what males and which females are, are, are together um, and that get along. And once I know that a male and a female get along, I don't have to see them breeding or anything. In fact, all the times that in all the years I've been doing this, I've only seen them connected or hooked up three times. Now, you know, obviously they've been doing a lot more than that, um, but I've only seen it three times. So it, either it's really quick or it's very infrequent and the ones that are, you know, that, that do uh, connect um, actually, you know, fertilize the egg and, and the insemination takes. So um, anyway, I uh, just, the male and the female that I know are going to get along, maybe from the previous year or, you know, I, you know, I experimented with them. Uh, another thing with the vision cages, by using vision cages, when I put them together and I'm in the snake room, which I, you know, I stay in there to, to make sure they're going to get along for a few hours before I, you know, before I feel comfortable leaving them, um, I can look in the vision cages and easily see if they're getting along, if they're not getting along, if, you know, what it looks like if they're fighting. Because um, males and females will sometimes fight just like two males will. And you'll think, you know, oh my God, you know, these are two males. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, they could be, but um, if you know from the previous year that you definitely have a male and female and they're fighting, then, you know, it, it could just be a scent thing. And in that case, I'll go ahead and pull them apart for maybe a day, then put them back together. And uh, usually by that time, they're, they're fine together. So anyway, I keep the same pairs together that I did, you know, the year before, the year before that. Um, if they had a successful, successful breeding and I got good eggs from them, then I'm just going to keep that pair together. Um, I don't swap the males around or the females or anything like that uh, because by doing that you could have the scent of one male on another female and then you put that female in with, you know, say male number three and he thinks the female's a male just by going off scent and then they combat and, you know, then you're not going to get any breeding like that. So, um, yeah, I just, I, you know, I feel comfortable keeping the same pairs together year after year. Now. If I've had a, a, you know, I mean, a, a, a female and a male, which I know are a female and a male, together for two years in a row, and they didn't produce any any eggs, then, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and try something different. You know, I'm going to probably, you know, make a note and then, you know, change the pairing of, of those two. And that way I can figure out whether it's the female that's, you know, maybe infertile or the male that's infertile or, you know, just, uh, you know, something's not working out. So um, that's... Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's generally what I do. And then, uh, you know, come uh, October, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, come uh, June is when I, uh, I get my eggs. And historically, um, when I uh, lived in Brooksville, Florida, I would, I would get the eggs every year at the, uh, like the last week, the last 10 days of June. It was like clockwork, it, always the same, no matter what I thought they were breeding or the time or anything. It was always the you know the last uh, ten days of June, so I moved back to Clearwater, Florida, and uh, you know uh, had my collection there for a time for about four years, and um, they were producing eggs the first week of June, and I mean I kept the same schedule for hibernation and you know bringing them out of hibernation and everything, um, but for some reason it was it you know the first the first ten days of June, which was fine because that means they're going to hatch a little earlier. But, um, you know, it just, I don't know why, uh, you know, as long as the, the breedings were successful, which they were, um, then, you know, I was happy with it. So you just have to, you know, just don't, uh, the, they don't read the book. What my friend Billy used to always say, the snakes, Gila monsters, reptiles, they don't read the book. So what you think you know or what you've read, eh, you know, might not be what's actually going to happen. So you got to be on the lookout for that and be ready for the eggs. That first year, I wasn't. I didn't have my incubation or my... Uh, um, uh, egg laying uh, medium in the uh, in the cages or in the containers uh, during that first week and uh, I started finding eggs Unfortunately, you know I checked on them every day so I was able to grab those eggs right away before they went bad but it, it could have been really bad if I was gone for a couple days and you know lost those eggs because that would just be soul crushing to lose a, uh, uh, a clutch of Gila monster eggs after you've worked all that time to get them um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, I think I covered everything, uh, and, and this is what works for me. I mean, other people do it differently. Uh, I know in the past I've tried a refrigerator because another guy that I knew in Florida was using a refrigerator, and it worked great for him. This guy was just like, every year he's popping out Gila monsters like corn snakes, and I'm like, man, what are you doing? And I tried the refrigerator for a year, maybe two. It didn't work at all for me. I got nothing. 
Um, and I, I think the, the the vibration of the motor and the and the refrigerator is going to kind of throw them off a little bit. Um, also, another thing about breeding them in Florida is that I mean you can't get it that cold, obviously, unless you put them in a meat locker or something. Which I, I did think about that for a while. Um, but uh, I think after a couple of years of hibernating at that same temperature, which is maybe a little bit warmer than they would normally hibernate at in, the, in, in nature, um, then they get used to it and that's when the natural, you know, uh, reproductive instinct takes over and they start to produce viable eggs and they'll breed just like they would if you hibernate them at lower conditions. So um, that is one thing that I noticed and um, yeah, I mean, I. I I think uh, yeah, that, that's about it. I, I mean, if you have any questions or you have different experiences, um, uh, you know, I'm always open. I'm sure everybody else is open to hearing about it because it helps everyone. I know back in the old days, people like to keep all their secrets secret, um, but I've always been one to, you know, share whatever I learn, you know, good or bad, and, you know, try and help out other enthusiasts. Um, also, I'll say this, with that many Gila monsters, um, I was not breeding all of them every year. I mean, I would I would maybe go a year, two years in between breeding, you know, those females. I would I would rotate them so I wasn't breeding them to death and um, you know, they can uh, a friend of mine um, actually produced eggs from a Gila monster at the age of 31. I mean, the Gila monster was 31 and she still produced good eggs. So, they have a long productive, you know, uh, window. Um, so there's really no reason other than just, you know, because you're in a hurry to get eggs or whatever, um, there's really no reason to hammer them uh, that hard. Uh, and uh, you know, once you have that many, you, you'll see what I mean. I mean, you just don't. Plus, you don't want a billion Gila monsters crawling all over. It's just uh, I, I I did that one year and it was it it was a nightmare. Um, I had way too many of them. Um, plus, you kill the market. So um, yeah, be careful of that too. But uh, if you have any questions or, uh, you know, uh, you contact me, um, I'm going to post this video on YouTube and uh, you can respond back with what worked for you or what didn't work or if you have any questions about what I do. Um, not that I'm the greatest Gila Monster breeder in the world, uh, but I, you know, I had some success doing it and I'm more than happy to share whatever I've learned with other people and, uh, you know, try and further the hobby. Um, I'll do anything to uh, help get people away from ball pythons so tired of ball pythons it's like yeah it's it's a python yeah i'm gonna make it you know pink pastel inchy fire whatever highway just stupid you know breed something different breed something interesting breed something with some character rather than a ball python so anyway that's just my little take on it my uh psa message for everybody so uh anyway have a good day Good luck breeding your healers, and I'll see you maybe next time with a, a video on uh, how to incubate the eggs and, and sex them. All right, later.